Welcome to Lecture 25A, um, entitled Introduction to Applying the Divergence Theorem and Silk's Theorem in 3D. Uh, the material for this lecture comes from reading Assignment 5, in particular the Introduction, Introduction to Section 2, Parts of Section 2.1, and Section 2.3. The objectives of this teaching module are basically to look at the classes of vector fields that we're going to be solving, also how to go about sketching irrotational source-free vector fields since the sketch is an important component of understanding the problem, then we'll look at divergent theorem for irrotational field problems under conditions of high degree of symmetry, uh, then Stokes theorem for source-free field problems again under a high degree of symmetry. Uh, in terms of concepts, definitions, and visualization skills, basically the most important things will be to know how to sketch fields and basically understand the various units and definitions. All right, second slide as usual is just an outline of the material to follow, uh, but so we'll move on to the next slide. All right, so this is a sort of a summary, sort of where we should be going over reading week in the following two weeks. And in terms of deliverables, which more or less are worked out problems, that sort of are typical of what you'd be tested on. Uh, you'd be looking at section 2.4, principle superposition, sort of the understanding principle, understanding the principle superposition. Uh, this is basically detailed in section 2.4. And then a number of worked out problems uh, in sections 3.5 and 4.6. 3.5 dealing with problems that invoke the divergence theorem and section 4.6 of problems that invoke Stokes theorem. In terms of the objectives over reading week in the following two weeks, on this side, this column, we have either videos or reading assignments that you should review. The reading assignment five short, this reading assignment zero, reading assignment four short, and also some online archi archive tutorial videos. So in assignment five short, these are different sections to consider. Introduction is section two. Uh, this is more or less in a sort of an order in the next couple of weeks. These are the sections that you should be looking at in assignment zero. Uh, this is our additional uh, assignments you should be looking at in reading assignment five. Uh, and similarly here, and then finally, uh, the online archive tutorial, tutorial videos, which you might find helpful. All right, so let's do an overview of reading assignment five. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, parts here that are highlighted in yellow are the ones that appear in the shorter version of assignment five, and also the uh, actual document, assignment five short, has, is a reduced version of the full document in reading assignment five. But in reading assignment five, we have uh, f five appendices and uh, the uh, main document refers to these appendices. There's also a document which shows the relations between vector calculus, calculus and Kirchhoff's current and voltage laws, as well as basic a, uh, application of Green's theorem and complex analysis. And so this is something that you could refer to if you want additional information and details, but in this course basically it's only for reference purposes, you're not responsible for this material. All right, so next thing is to do is to figure out um, how we're going to solve problems, particularly how to determine the field F. So it's computing the vector field F when the curl of F and the divergence F are knowns or givens. So we start with the Helmholtz equation, which says that you can decompose any field in terms of a uh, irrotational field and a source-free field. So the rotational field is described in terms of minus the gradient of a scalar potential, and the uh, source-free field is uh, based on the curl of a vector potential. This is a, another vector field. So this is a more or less a starting point. And so if we now take the curl of this expression, followed by the divergence of this expression, we end up with the two following expressions. The curl basic you apply to the right-hand side, but we know from previous work in assignment four that the curl of a gradient is zero, and we're just left with the curl of a curl of a vector potential. And this basically we're going to call a new vector, j. We take the divergence, then we'd be taking the divergence of a gradient plus the divergence of a curl. But we also know that this is equal to zero, leaving us just with this term. And this also can be written as the Laplacian operating on a scalar potential. 
And this basically we're going to call rho. So in an electromagnetics problem, this would be a current flux density. In an electrostatics problem, this would be a charge density. So in summary, these are the two equations that are typically given. The divergence of the field is a given. The curl of the field is given. All right. And so that next question would be, is the uniqueness of the solution for F? Well, it's guaranteed if rho and j decay at a fast enough rate when approaching infinity, which we call the boundary. And this is the situation that will occur in practice. There are more details in the expanded set of notes, but we're not going to deal with it at this point here. Boundaries placed at a finite distance of the source can also be considered, but this is outside the scope of this course. Again, the detailed notes basically talk a little bit about this, but you're not responsible for it. So the problem statement you'll be given will always have this sort of form. You'll be given a row and you'll give them a, a J and you need to compute F. That's more or less what we're going to be doing. All right, so the class of vector fields F that will be solved. So I've just put in bullet form the different things that are of importance. First of all, solving for F is difficult for the most general of cases, but those are, that's, those are not the cases we're going to consider. We're going to look at problems where we know we have a high degree of symmetry and that the field is either circulation free or source free. And then F can be computed, basically making use of what we already know, basically applying a divergent theorem or Stokes theorem. The two independent cases that we will consider, assuming symmetry conditions are imposed on rho or j, are that the divergence is rho and the curl of the field is zero. This is what we call an rotational field. And the other class of problem is where the divergence is zero and the curl of F is J. And this is a source-free field. The symmetries that we'd be looking at typically come in different forms. So for example, planar symmetry, cylindrical symmetry, circle symmetry, periodic symmetry, toroidal symmetry, to name a few. There are all sorts of symmetries you can consider. But we're going to take the, take the simplest classes. Note, at various points in these notes, the sim symbols may be used to describe a different physical property. So, for example, we use, we use the symbol R to describe the radius and spherical coordinates instead of rho in order to avoid confusion with charge density, which will be designated as rho. Also, J is used to describe a current flux density for the examples that we're going to be looking at, which are primarily of electromagnetics nature, but can also represent a general vector field in other cases. Okay, so next thing is basically to look at the solution approach accounting for a high degree of symmetry. And so these are the conditions you're looking for. In an appropriate coordinate system, F satisfies the following conditions. First of all, the vector F has a magnitude, which is a function of only one variable. And secondly, the vector F has a direction vector aligned with only one of the unit basis vectors. So if we're dealing with cylindrical coordinates, basically we have the radial component, the theta component, and the z component. So the basis vectors would be either r hat, theta hat, or z hat. That would be essentially, we're talking about basis vectors. All right, so we're going to be using the integral formulation to solve this type of problem. So under the condition stated above, it's possible to apply the divergence theorem or Stokes theorem to convert the partial differential equations, that is, divergence of field f equals rho and the curl of f equals j, into an integral form and then solve for f. So for any rotational field, this is basically the differential form. And if we use the divergence theorem, then we basically know that if we take a surface integral, closed surface integral of f over the surface, that's equivalent to taking the divergence of the vector field integrated over the volume dv. But the divergence of field is rho. So this would be like integrating the total charge enclosed with the volume, charge density, which is also called the total charge enclosed. So this is a type of expression that we'll be working with. If, on the other hand, we're dealing with a source-free field, the divergence of field is zero, the curl of the field is j, and now we use Stokes theorem. So if I were to take a closed contour integral of f dot ds along the contour, then this is equivalent to the curl of f integrate a dot product with a differential surface area, which basically is bounded by this contour on the, on the left. However, from the expression up here, we know that the curl of f is nothing more than j. And so we can substitute that in here. But if you look at this, j dot ds, this is nothing more than integrating the current flux density over an area bounded by the contour. And this we call the total current enclosed. 
So these are the two expressions that we're going to be working with. And next term in ECE221S, these are the sorts of calculations you'll be doing. All right, so let's look at some examples illustrating high degree of symmetry, planar symmetry, cylindrical symmetry. This is also cylindrical symmetry. In this case, again, we're only dealing here at the moment of the XY plane. You can see that it's, the field is only pointing along one direction, either the minus x hat direction or the x hat direction. And so here you'll see that f is equal to f is a function of x, x hat. All right, and so the fact that we've got this in the direction of one unit vector and only a function of one variable basically satisfies the condition of symmetry that we alluded to in a previous slide. In this case, it's just a, in the form of a circle. We can write this in the following form. But if you'll know, this here basically is nothing more than, than a vector field, a unit vector in, in a form of a circle. And this base square root of x squared plus y squared is nothing more than the radius. So this would be in the radial direction. So we can essentially say that the field is in the direction of theta hat, but its magnitude depends on the radius. So again, this satisfies the condition of the symmetry that we basically considered in the previous slide. In this case, the field is in a radial direction, so we could express it in the following form. This is the unit vector, and this is a function of x squared plus y squared square root. Well, this is nothing more than the radius. So again, it's a function of one of the variables in the new coordinate system, and also as a function of the unit vector, the radial unit vector in cylindrical coordinates. So these are symmetry conditions that typically we'd be looking at. All right, we can also have spherical symmetry. Now, this is a three-dimensional problem in this case. So in this case, what we would have is a unit vector pointing in a radial direction if we're dealing with symmetry, a spherical symmetry. And this term now represents the radius uh, basically uh, in a 3D system if we're dealing with spherical symmetry. So again, because we have that the uh, field's magnitude depends only on one of the uh, uh, vectors, magnitude of the unit, one of the um, uh, ray, um, one of the variables for the uh, uh, new coordinate system, and also the direction of the field is in the direction of one of the unit vectors, namely r hat, means that this is a type of problem that we can be uh, that we'll be able to solve. All right, so now just a couple of guidelines for sketching vector fields for f. First of all, the rotational field followed by the source-free field. So these are just general points to observe when you're doing. Um, and, uh, sketches. First of all, in the case of your irritational field, the vector field lines diverge from or converge to the source. Outwards if the scalar density rho is positive and inwards if the scalar density rho is negative. Second, each differential element of the source can be considered as a point source. So if I had, for instance, a distribution of charges, I could essentially say that that distribution consists of an infinite number of point sources, and each one of those point sources basically would produce a field in line with the first bullet item. And then essentially these, all these different fields can be superimposed to produce the total field. Thirdly, the field pattern for a point source is a series of lines spreading out radially from the source. And fourthly, the total field at a given point as we just stated, is the superposition of the field lines from all of the differential sources. For a source-free field, the direction of the flux density J at any given point from a geometrical standpoint, in other words, uh, if you look at it from a geometrical standpoint, it's akin to the direction of a localized axis of rotation. Secondly, the direction of the field is determined using the right-hand rule, which means that the thumb points along the axis of rotation, which is the direction of J, and the vector field F forms closed contours in the direction in which the fingers of the right hand point. The third item is that the vector field F forms closed contours since the field is source free. Why? Because the divergence F equals zero. And fourthly, the divergence of the curl of a vector field is the divergence of J, which is equal to zero. Therefore, the vector field J must also form closed contours. So when you actually base sketch uh, the current flux density, it's implied that the field lines form closed, um, closed loops. Okay, general note. Regions where the vector field lines are straight, parallel to each other, and spaced equidistantly are regions where the field is uniform. And secondly, regions where the density of field lines increases in a particular direction are where the intensity of the field is increasing. So these are just guidelines that help you determine how to go about sketching field lines. 
So let's look at the irrotational field case. We have two charges, a positive charge and a negative charge. These are like basically good trend, just points. So this is positive, so the field lines basically point outwards. And this is negative, so the field lines point inwards. And so these field lines basically pointing outwards will eventually point inwards and attach to the minus. So one of these field lines that emanates from the positive charge basically terminates at the minus charge. So this is essentially a very rough sketch of what the field lines ought to look like of this nature. Notice here the, the line that's halfway between these two charges. This line basically is perpendicular at this point. So this is very generally what you can use to sort of help you understand what the field lines would look. Again, displacement field lines bunching implies a strengthening field. So here they're bunching, so the field gets stronger as you get closer to the positive or closer to the minus. And again, field lines point outwards from a positive source, which is what you see here, and point inwards to a negative source, which is what you see here. All right, what about a source-free field? So this is an example, for instance, the Earth's magnetic field. It appears as if there's a current flowing around in a circle like this. Of course, this is just showing one loop here, but this would be a distribution. So it'd be a current flux density distributed all over this, this volume that you're seeing here. But this is the general direction that we would assume. So first thing to assume here is that the magnetic field lines bunching means a strengthening field. So you'll notice the red lines are the field lines. So they're getting stronger as you get closer to the globe. Secondly, the field lines which are shaded red and the current density J labeled as I, which is this one here, form closed loops. So see this current, this forms a closed loop, and the field lines, these of course will go into the system and come out the other side as well. So the conditions that we spoke about in previous slides, um, this, basic, this diagram basically satisfies both conditions, that the divergence of J is equal to zero and the divergence of the field is also equal to zero. And thirdly, the right hand thumb points in the direction of I, the current flux through a filament, and the field lines, if this is taken as a current filament, uh, and, and the field lines shaded in red point in the direction of the right hand fingers. So if you were to take your thumb and point it in this direction, then basically your fingers would be basically pointing downwards through here. So that means the field lines come through the center, out the other side, and eventually come back forming a closed loop. So that's a very quick way of assessing the relationship between the direction of the current flux density and the direction of the field lines. All right, some units and definitions just to review. Again, contour integration, that's differential arc length is typically given this notation, ds with a, an arrow over top. Surface area integration, the differential surface area vector at a given point on an arbitrarily shaped surface is just ds with an arrow over top. In terms of terminology, sometimes use dA with an arrow instead of ds over error if the differential surface area in 3D is planar. And in terms of vector notation, vectors are sometimes written bold rather than with an arrow over top. So ds with an arrow is equivalent to ds bold, dA with an arrow over top is equal to dA bold, and ds with an arrow over top is equivalent to ds bold. Alternatively, ds bold is equal to the unit tangent vector in bold, ds, uh, dA, uh, in bold, which would be equivalent to the unit vector n in bold, dA, and ds bold, which is, uh, equals the unit vector uh, n subscript f ds. So this would be a differential surface area vector for a curved surface, for a planar surface, and this is basically for contour. As far as densities, there are two types of densities to consider. We'll differentiate between the term scalar density rho and flux density j. The scalar density rho is a scalar value function, whereas flux density j is a vector valued function. Second, the scalar value function rho and the vector value function j can either be differentiable, and not differentiable, or incorporate direct delta distributions, which we'll be discussing shortly. So what are direct delta distributions used for? They are used to represent point, line, or filament, planar, sheet, or curve sheet sources for the charge density. Or they represent line, filament, planar sheet, or curved sheet sources for current flux densities. So this would be for the case of applying the divergence theorem. This is the case for applying Stokes theorem. Uh, the closed surface integral over a surface, closed surface S, F dot ds, S is often referred, referred to as a Gaussian surface. So whenever you see something like this, 
in terms of when we do some applications and we talk about a Gaussian surface, we're referring to this surface here. All right, so that concludes Lecture 25A. Thank you for listening.